I know that last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And often we think a little bit extra about the Holy Spirit. But I thought, you know, uh, we cannot relegate and we don't the teaching and truth of the Holy Spirit to one Sunday. So I want to continue today. When I think of the church 2,000 years ago, it was quite a hopeless situation. The disciples had walked with Jesus. They had been trained by Jesus. They had seen miracles of Jesus. And so when Jesus rose again, God sent an angel. And the angel said, Jesus is risen. And what does it say about these disciples? It says they didn't believe. They didn't believe. Then there were two women who had seen the empty tomb. And they brought the message to a group of disciples. And they said, they said, Jesus is risen. And what did we learn about the disciples? They didn't believe. Quite a tough bunch. You would have thought they would have done a bit better after being three years with Jesus, walking with Jesus, getting all that teaching. And yet Jesus said to those believers, 120 of them in total, that you will receive power and you go out and preach in all the world. You say, how is that possible? Uh, these weak-minded people who even an angel wasn't enough to get them excited. It was because what Jesus was about to do to them. They were about to receive the mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it would change everything. So I want to tell you, there's hope for everybody in this room. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for you. If those disciples were so way off kilter, you know, and so full of unbelief, guess what? By the power of the Holy Spirit, everyone can be transformed. The Holy Spirit is likened to fire, to water, to wind, you know, just uh, that changes the landscape, fire that energizes. The Holy Spirit is in one place called the earnest of our inheritance, like a down payment. We, uh, we have the Holy Spirit now in our lives, and we know that there's something better to come. It's a down payment. Now, there's a picture of the Holy Spirit that is given to us when Jesus was baptized. In Matthew 3, 16, it says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon him. So here, the Holy Spirit is likened to a dove. I hasten to say the Holy Spirit is not fire, wind, or a dove. The Holy Spirit is a person. But these were illustrations given to help the people understand how the Holy Spirit worked. And we know that the dove is a symbol of peace today. So I thought of that to, to hang this teaching in a way that, that we can remember it easily. Uh, there is a story in Scripture where the dove features prominently. And I'm going to read from that story and then draw the parallel towards the Holy Spirit. It says in Genesis 8, in the story of Noah, that you know about Noah and the ark and the flood waters. And then the boat had stopped on the top of the mountain. And it says the following about Noah. Noah also sent out from himself a dove. Sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned to the ark, for the waters of, on the, were on the face of, of the earth. So Noah put out his hand and took the dove and drew her into himself. Now that's the first picture of a dove that found no resting place. And I submit to you, that is a picture of how the Holy Spirit worked in the part of the Bible we call the Old Testament. It was like the Holy Spirit was sent out, just like the dove was sent from the ark, but, but the Holy Spirit touched people, but found no resting place, didn't stay. It says about David, the Holy Spirit came upon David, and then it somehow lifted. And the Holy Spirit of God came on Samson and on Saul and all these different people, but didn't stay on them. So really, it's not relevant to us, except there's a problem. Many believers today think that they're still living at that time where the Holy Spirit comes and goes. 
Many believers are nervous. Oh, I got to get the Spirit. Oh, I don't know. I felt the Spirit two weeks ago. I felt the Spirit last year. Oh, come Holy Spirit. They think the Spirit comes and goes. So they're still living in this old covenant mentality concerning the Holy Spirit. They think, for example, that you, you know, the Holy Spirit comes to a certain place. So they say, now the Spirit is moving here, and now the Spirit is moving there. And then they think that, you know, if, if they do anything wrong, or I, I lost my temper, I got mad, I had a temptation, I fell asleep reading the Bible all week long, never could make it through. They said, oh, now the Holy Spirit must be displeased with me. No, the Holy Spirit has come, and he will never leave you. So we are not chasing. Oh, come on. That's right. We are not shaking. So I want you to shake off what I call charismatic mysticism. Hey, it's a disease. It can be quite contagious. Charismatic mysticism where you're always looking for the Holy Spirit to come. You know, I, I, I told the story that uh, at one time, uh, you know, people were always teaching about how the Holy Spirit is so sensitive. So the slightest wrong that you could do then the Holy Spirit would just psh, be gone. And, and, and I never liked that. In fact, I, I didn't see that in the Scripture, but what really turned me off years ago, I think I told you the story, I was in one church, and the pastor had trained the people that the Holy Spirit was so super sensitive. What kind of a friend is that? Do you want a super sensitive friend to come and visit you? That's just so super sensitive, have that tentacles of sensitivity out? This is, a, this is a caricature of the Holy Spirit. So in this particular church in Ontario, not some other place, the pastor had trained the people, oh, you know, you put that oh on it, it, it sounds spiritual, oh, the Holy Spirit is so sensitive. So he had said that, that the worship time, the singing in the beginning of the service was especially sensitive. And they would sing like for an hour, an hour and a half, you know. And, and, and he said, no one can go to the washroom. So the ushers had to lock up the washrooms while this very sensitive time was ongoing because the Holy Spirit is sensitive, could lift. And I, I was in this church as a guest preacher, and because I, I wasn't too happy, I was sitting in the back. I didn't want to be a part of all the foolery in the front. So I was sitting in the back, and it just so happened there was a mother and a little girl beside me. And the girl said to her mother, I need to go pee. And, and, and the mother said, no, 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 no. Can't go to the washroom. Holy Spirit is sensitive. This went on. and was, Can I go pee, mama? No. You know what happened? Eventually, she peed in the back of the church. I, I thought to myself, how stupid can Christians get? That is ultra charismatic mysticism on steroids. But let me say, if, even if you don't go that far, the Holy Spirit is your friend doesn't come and go. Amen? Give the Lord a big hand for that. Now, now, let me read some more. Genesis 8. I'm still in Genesis 8. Now, it says, Noah waited another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came to him in the evening with a freshly plucked olive leaf in her mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So the second picture of a dove is with a, a dove with a freshly plucked olive leaf. And again, the olive leaf speaks of peace, and the dove itself speaks of peace. So you have a double peace symbol here. And, and, and so what does this dove with an olive branch speak of? I say it speaks about the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. You know, Jesus was dependent on the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was... Um, baptized and the Spirit came as a dove as we have read. He was led by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. And so Jesus was this giver of peace. He was announcing peace has come. If you think about how Jesus dealt with sinners, people who had done bad things, he said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to to save you. If you think about how Jesus dealt with the topic of righteousness, he didn't say, oh, you got to smarten up and make yourself more righteous. He said, just seek after God's kingdom and after God's own righteousness. You, you just focus on that God is righteous and all the things that you want for, they're going to be added to you. 
And when it came to fear of evil powers, devils and demons, Jesus spoke about that often. And he says, well, a strong man may have a house, but then a stronger one comes, and he takes his spoils away. Well, guess who the stronger one is? It's Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, they knew from walking by Jesus, he's not condemning, he's welcoming us. But then Jesus was teaching them about the Holy Spirit. So he said in uh, John 16, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. So we could expect now that the Holy Spirit will convict in the same way that Jesus did. I heard one preacher one time, he preached a message called, the Holy Spirit is the bloodhound of heaven. Just like the bloodhound can sniff a nano drop of blood, every sin in your life, the Holy Spirit is sniffing it out. It was a good way to put fear in people. But again, it's, it's not what Jesus said. Who would want a, a friend that sniffs out everything that's wrong with you? I say, stay in your own house. Don't come and visit us. Uh, uh, but, but you see, so people have said that. Well, sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit is convict, convicted of. Yes, in the same way that Jesus did. And then, if you don't trust me in this, trust Jesus. He says in the next verse, of sin, because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So what was the sin problem? Of all the sins that Jesus could have mentioned, he said the one sin that the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of is not believing in Jesus. That's the sin. It's not all the other things, you know. Uh, we, we like to, people say, oh, I'm a prophet. I, I can see all the sins in Canada. You know, you don't have to be a prophet to see all the sins in Toronto. You just read the Toronto Star. There's plenty every day for you to see the sins and the problems and the breakdowns and the murders and the shootings. We don't need any special prophetic gift to know that there's trouble in Toronto. Come on. Or in Canada or Vancouver or Halifax or Calgary. No. But the Holy Spirit convicts of the sin of not believing on Jesus. You know, sometimes... I've come across spooky Christians, spooky, and they join hands, and they say, and they look very spiritual and say, Holy Spirit, and they have that special tremble, you know, oh, because that's, that's the anointing, Holy Spirit, show us our sins, what's wrong with us, what kind of phoniness is that, you don't need the Holy Spirit to show your sins, you already know your sins. You already know it. Don't spook it up and make it all spiritual. If you slandered somebody, if you lied about somebody, you know it. You don't need to say, oh, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that I spent half an hour gossiping on the phone. You know it. Don't get spooky about it. But the wonderful thing, and, and, and don't do that, don't gossip, not even for 30 seconds. I'm not saying condoning it. But the wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit in that situation comes to you and says, yeah, yes, the fact is true that you gossiped or you did that or you did that, but you can come to Jesus. Don't give up on Jesus. You run back to Jesus. He will help you to live right. He will help you to live God. He, the Holy Spirit convicts you of Jesus. He's, he says, when all have branch of peace, God's not angry with you, but he's convicting you, run to Jesus. And, and he convicts of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. So many have interpreted that to think that the Holy Spirit convicts of unrighteousness, but it doesn't say that. Convicts of righteousness, of the righteous one who has gone to sit by the Father, Jesus Christ. That's, this is where you say, well, I, I blew it. I, I can't go to church. I can't shake hands with Pastor Nathan because I, I've been so bad. I've been bad. I haven't been to church for five weeks. I've been bad. And I haven't been reading my Bible. And So you go around like that beating yourself. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He says, well, maybe you think you've been bad. But you, you have the righteousness of Jesus. So run back to Jesus. 
And no matter how bad you've been, you fell asleep every time you tried to read the Bible and you did this and you slept in and everything else is wrong with you, guess what? God gives you His righteousness. So you go to Toronto Celebration Church and you look Pastor Nathan straight in the face and say, Hallelujah, I'm in this thing. I'm a part of this family. I tell you, move over, devil. You haven't, that's the other. That, see, see, we made the Holy Spirit into someone who beats us up. You don't need to get beaten up by your best friend. You know, we have such a litany of people who are speaking God's going to judge and God's going to do this and that. No, the Holy Spirit comes to convict people of run to Jesus. Jesus is your righteousness. And then of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You know, I'm going to be in Africa soon. I know among my African friends, some of them are so afraid of demons. Same in Indonesia. They have television shows and secular television impersonating demons. And, 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 so, so, and, in, and in Toronto, we have it too. So, so people are so afraid of demons. So afraid I'm exposing myself to a demon. But, but Jesus' message is that the Holy Spirit doesn't point you to demons and enlarge demons. People say, oh, I've been praying, and now I really see what the devil is doing. Well, I don't know who you were praying to, some mumbo-jumbo thing you were praying to. Because if you commune with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't show you what the devil is doing and how big the devil is and how afraid you're going to be of the devil. No, the Holy Spirit shows you that the devil has been defeated. The devil, you know, I rarely, you know, I, 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 as, as a pastor, I rarely correct guest speakers. In fact, I've only had one guest speaker here in this church that I corrected publicly. And it was on a Monday night. So there was only 100 people here. You say, who was it? I'm not going to tell you. You have to come on Monday night services. Huh? Uh, uh, but I publicly corrected. So, I, so I'm not given to public correction. But one time in the church I was at before I had to give a correction. I had gone away and everything was wonderful. And then some preacher had come in and convinced the members of the church that riches and demons were attending prayer meetings. At first, I just uh, waved this off, thinking, well, uh, this will blow away. But people took a hold of that. So suddenly, we used to have beautiful prayer meetings. Now they weren't beautiful anymore. People were like looking, standing in the corner, saying, where, where is So I had to say to them, well, what's, what's gotten into you? I said, there are probably more demons at Walmart. Uh, but, but I don't want to pick on Walmart either. But people got caught because they don't know the gospel. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows us that the devil, demons, evil has been defeated. Jesus went to Hades. He defeated principalities and powers. And he made a show of them openly. Oh, come on, get happy about that. So peace world. Okay, okay I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Verse 12, Genesis 8, 12. Still talking about the dove. He waited yet another seven days and he sent out the dove and it did not return again to him. So the third picture of a dove is the dove that found a resting place and didn't return. That is the picture of how the Holy Spirit works in the life of believers. In your life, the Holy Spirit doesn't come and lift the Holy Spirit comes and rests in you, stays with you. John 14 says, uh, Jesus says, the Father will give you another helper to abide with you forever. He dwells with you and will be in you, with you, in you, abiding with you, never leave you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, protected by the Holy Spirit, empowered, guided by the Holy Spirit. You have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit, even when you don't feel anything. You say, I don't even think I'm a Christian. I don't think even God loves me. But the Holy Spirit bears witness with you, says, no, 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 no. You are loved. You are loved. You belong to Jesus. Oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. You know, I thought of this uh, dove illustration. You know, in many languages, in the English language, we make a distinction between the dove and the pigeon. But in many languages, it's actually the same word. 
So I'm going to just enlarge that interpretation a little bit. You've heard of pigeon races. You've heard of the precision of a pigeon. You know, back in the days when, when these uh, scriptures were written, the pigeon was used to send a, or the dove, to send a message, maybe 1,000 kilometers, two, 3,000 kilometers away. In, in, in the wars of history with it, it was Genghis Khan or Napoleon or whoever, they used uh, uh, doves as messengers. And I thought, there's another picture, the Holy Spirit. Like even here this morning, or those who may hear this message on television, the Holy Spirit knows precisely where you are at. So what this service will mean to a person over here may be very different to what it means to a person over here or what it means to a person watching on television. Somebody may see this in one part of the country, someone in another part of the country. And the Holy Spirit is the master to reach that target of hurt or pain with precision. Thank God for it. Thank God for it. Like, like, lift your hand and just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you never leave me nor forsake me. You know, so even in this room, let's be open to the Holy Spirit finding your life, finding your need. You know, maybe somebody today is receiving God's call. Maybe your career is changing. Maybe you're going in a different direction. Maybe you thought, I'm doing this and this. But it could be that God is calling someone. Or it could be that somebody is like the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, he was reading the Bible, and, and he, he couldn't understand. But then the, by the Spirit, Philip went to him. It could be that by the Holy Spirit, you happen to come here. You're not just by accident here. It's not just something, oh, I don't know. I've been to church for a few months. I go, no, somehow you're here. And God knows what's in your heart. God knows what you need. You, you know, others can be overwhelmed with condemnation. I'm thinking of that uh, uh, prison warden recorded in the Bible. He was overwhelmed with guilt and shame, and, and he didn't know what to do. And he heard the words, just believe on the Lord Jesus, and you and your house shall be saved. Everything changed. Think about Simon, uh, think about Paul the apostle. He was such an arrogant person. He was so full of himself, so full of his religion. But, you know, the Holy Spirit had a way to get through to his conscience and to his heart. And so the Holy Spirit has a way to get through to you. Holy Spirit, is, we, we don't believe in doing Christian work without the Holy Spirit. You know, I sense that there's somebody here, and I'm not going to ask you to lift your hand. You have really been wrestling with hopelessness. You've been feeling even fantasizing. I'm not saying that you would do it, but you've been fantasizing about just taking your life. What's the sense in living? And you have ended up here hearing me in this room or hearing me on television, and the Holy Spirit is reaching out to you, saying, no, those thoughts are a lie. That's false. You have a future. You have a hope. The Holy Spirit will make Jesus real to you. Someone else will feel like I've messed up. You haven't thought of doing away with yourself, but you just feel like, ah, I just give up on all this. You know, the Holy Spirit knows you. He knows how to read your diary. And he's saying, no, no, you've been thinking wrong. If you would start to allow, just allow a little tiny bit of Jesus and his love to touch you, your life can go in a different direction. This is what we call the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, the gift of faith. You know, suddenly something happens. Somebody's healed. Somebody's restored. Somebody finds how their mental illness that they struggle with, the more they expose themselves to Jesus Christ and, and the Holy Spirit reminds them of Jesus, they find that mental illness dissipating. And people say, what happened to you? You're different. You're not the same person. And you can hardly even explain it yourself. But what really happened was that the Holy Spirit was allowed to speak to you. And the Holy Spirit made Jesus so great that everything else began to shrink, including your problems and hang-ups and addictions began to shrink until they were gone. Praise God for that. You know, there are people, I, I just don't know. Take a moment here now because uh, we don't have more to say, but uh, I believe the gifts of healing are in operation. 
in this room right now. I believe there are people with sciatic nerve problem. Jesus is healing your lower back. If something is happening, that uh, fracture is gone in your hip socket. That fracture that causes you to feel pain and you kind of have to compensate for how you stand. Jesus Christ is healing you. Someone who was in a car accident and damaged your neck, the power of Jesus Christ is touching you. The Holy Spirit knows your precise need. That's why there's never two testimonies that are the same. I don't no matter how many years I've been doing this, there'll be something different because no two stories are the same. Put your hand on your chest right now and just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to me. And I receive healing. I receive quickening. I receive health from the top of my head to the soles of my feet in Jesus' name. Oh, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. You see, sometimes we're thinking that this has to happen at the end of the service. But you know, the Lord can just do a work. You're in the communion. We, we often receive, but it doesn't have to be any set time. I just know that right now, Jesus is touching you. We prayed and thank God for somebody's knee being healed. I don't know who had sent in that request, but frankly, there could be a dozen of you in this room with knee problems or in the name of Jesus, kick and move that leg and, and say, thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes I was healed. Amen. And so... Holy Spirit is like that dove that found a resting place. He doesn't leave you. He said, well, what if I blew it? He still doesn't leave you. You're not that powerful. You're, you blowing it, you messing up is not so powerful. That the little quaint Holy Spirit says, well, I got, I got to leave now. I can't stand here because old Joey, he, he, he lost his temper. Forget it. What kind of a Holy Spirit would that be? No, he is with you forever. And he keep pointing you to Jesus. That's why Pastor Nathan and I, we don't go around telling people all that, you need to change this or you need to change this. Because, you know, what we do, we preach Christ here. And we trust the Holy Spirit to tell you and, and talk to you about changes in your life. Then you can't blame Pastor Nathan. He can get blamed for every time you have to change. You can blame the Holy Spirit and say, well, I don't know. Pastor Nathan is just innocent. I'm just standing here preaching Jesus. I don't know anything. I see nothing. I hear nothing, even though he does. But he could just act like that and say, it's, I leave it. The Holy Spirit could change your life and give us different priorities. Now, what about this? About the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, that's, that's contested. It was a new concept to the believers. And, and Jesus had said in John 7, if anybody thirst, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What's he talking about? This he spoke of the spirit which they that believed on Jesus would receive. Now there's a parallel here. First of all, when you receive the gift of salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not his. So sometimes Pentecostal charismatic people have maybe used the wrong terminology. They say, have you got the spirit? Have you got the spirit? And they're meaning referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But really every believer, everyone who has received Jesus has the spirit. You have received this fountain of water inside of you. But then that fountain of water, that life of the Spirit that is in you, you're born again by the Spirit of God, it will flow up on you. We call that the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say baptism. And, and, and I, I want us to look at that. Every, baptism. What does that mean? It means to be surrounded on all sides. Next Sunday as we do here often, we baptize people in water. We have a tank here. We open it. There's a couple of people standing there, and then they immerse you. And I have stood here watching, sometimes with a little tear in my eye, as I rejoice what God is doing in our church with so many baptismal services. I guess, I don't know how many we've had since we opened up, but we've had many. And, and, but I noticed when I observed the people being baptized in the water, they don't swallow the water. 
And frankly, after 25 people being baptized, I wouldn't want you to swallow the water. Who knows what's floating in there? But I notice that they get swallowed in the water. How many of you know the difference? And see, you could say that when, when you receive salvation, you drink of the Spirit. But when you are baptized in the Spirit, you are swallowed in the water. The water is all around you. You begin to enter a new dimension of living. Another word, and you notice the consistency that we find in these words, it says the Holy Spirit fell on them. Fell on them. Everybody say fell on. Um, that's the, the, the Greek word epipipto, and it means to fall around, to embrace. It's like the, the father fell on the neck of the son. Come on up here. Alex, come here. Now, I'm going to fall on you. You know, I'm a pretty heavy guy. Are you sure you can handle this? Yes. I'm going to fall on you, all right? So notice he's not going to swallow me. He's not going to. Are you sure you can handle this? Okay, here we go. Oh. You see, now, that's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit fell on them, fell on them. So it's not that he, he received something. He didn't eat me. I fell on him. And, and while you're here, bring me a cup of water. Bring me a cup of water. Uh, anybody has water? Because there's another word. Here, here we come. Here we go. I got it. I got it. Come here. It's another word used, and these are consistent. It says, the Spirit was poured out on them. You, you see? <laughs> the Spirit was poured out. So it is... The, the illustration is baptized, you're swallowed in it, it, it comes on you, and then it, 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 it fell, on them, fell on them, and then poured out. For example, like if, if I was to, I haven't decided whether I will or not at this point, but I'm kind of in the throes of decision making. If I, if I was to pour the water on him, on Alex, it doesn't mean that he would get the water in him, would it? I don't know, I'm getting close here now. I, I want to see, do we have the camera angle on this here, just in case? Here, oh, well, there we go. Did you see that? Okay, I'll do one more drop because some of you didn't see it. Oh, there's a, all right. So it's poured out on him. Give, give Alex a big hand. Thank you, Alex. And take the bottle with you. Take that with you. You see, it's poor. So it's consistent language. So for our friends who say, oh, I don't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this very consistent biblical language. Another, another, the way it says is they were clothed, endued, clothed. You know, you know, you don't eat your clothes. You don't swallow them. They are around you. So when you receive Christ, the Spirit, God's Spirit comes into you. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like you are immersed into the Spirit. You're clothed in the Spirit. And, and you know, you receive that. Just like a wide receiver receives the ball. You can't just stand like this. You, you actively receive that. That's the word used. The Greek word is lambano. It's not being passive. It's like you're receiving that ball coming across the field. And, and you receive it by faith. You know, in my book, The Faith That Works, uh, which you receive as a gift here in the church. Now, I was over in Calgary preaching last Sunday. I had three services. And I sold out that book in the first service. I should have brought more. So it's a good book. And they had to pay for it. But you get it for free here. Don't tell the people in Calgary. Oh, maybe they're watching. But anyway, they, they, you know, I tell the story how it's faith involved. Talk about how I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I had received Jesus. I, I was, uh, had been what we call saved. I acknowledged Jesus as my Savior. And, and I was still very timid. People don't believe that. They said, oh, Peter, you're naturally just so outspoken and you're so bold. No, no, I was in many areas, but when it came to Jesus, I was a little bit ashamed. I didn't want his name to be mentioned. I would go the other way. So while I may have been bold in other areas, I was not bold concerning Jesus. And so then a year later, I was at this particular camp for three weeks. And, you know, people get all kinds of ideas in the head. I tell you in my book. So there's this young man. He says, well, he, he, he acted like he knew it, but he didn't know it, but he thought he knew it. He said, if you really want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says, we have a prayer meeting at 7 a.m. every morning for those who are sincerely, only the sincere ones, 7 a.m., can come to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
So he came and personally said to me, you want to come? I said, no. Uh, 7 a.m. is too early. I was a teenager. I wanted to sleep. I had busy nights. I wanted to sleep. And, 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 but he says, well, I'll come and wake you up. So literally at 5 to 7, he would come to my room and he'd shake me and say, we got to go. So off we go to this chapel. And there we are from 7 to 8 praying God baptize in the Holy Spirit. God do it. It's about maybe 10 of us. This went on for a whole week. 10 days. Guess what? None of us had received one thing. But over those 10 days, I can look back and say a certain smugness had crept in. And we kind of felt, well, if anybody's going to receive, it should be us, you know. I mean, we're up at 7 a.m., so God must notice that. And, and, but we didn't get it. Then one night we were having a meeting, and this guy who was so holy, who kind of got me out of bed and everybody else, he had a brother, a stepbrother, who was a real devil, let me tell you. I mean, he was like, well, I, I broke some rules, but this guy was on illegal stuff. He, he, was, he was just, he was, you know, bad. He didn't even attend any meetings that were supposed to, you were mandatory attendance. He didn't come. Never mind the morning prayer meeting. Of course, he didn't come to that, but he didn't even come to the mandatory meetings. And that night, the stepbrother, walks into our meeting. We were surprised to see him. And he says, I need Jesus. And we said, yeah, he sure does. You know, we, we agreed on that part. He needs Jesus. And so everybody prayed. He, he received Christ as Savior. Ten minutes later, this guy, the bad apple, is baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaks with other tongues. You know how we felt like We've been up at 7 a.m. for a week and a half. Doesn't that give us some pointers here? This guy. And then it got worse. About 10 minutes after that, he starts to prophesy. We hear out of his mouth, thus saith the Lord. The Lord is speaking. And it was actually a pretty good prophecy, except it came out of the wrong mouth. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so it taught me it's, it, it's by grace. It's not by your effort. It's by faith you receive. And it did away with all that. People say, oh, they get spooky again. You know, the spooky people say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. So you better make sure you're holy. Well, he was the least holy. And he got it first. Now, I'm not speaking against going to prayer meeting at 7 a.m. I'm merely saying that, that you don't receive it by getting pointers. And you receive it in different ways. You know, when I finally received, it changed my personality. And I became quite bold for Jesus, probably too bold for some. But I kind of, you know, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I did speak out in tongues. And uh, it was uh, kind of, I realized how simple it was. I was like, I could have yielded to this before. I could have yielded. Others, you know, receive. Like when Tina received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how many know that my lovely wife, she doesn't go around gesturing and flailing her arms all 24-7. She's kind of a, more, you know, like that. She, I think she fell on the floor. She was in a theater. I mean, it was a meeting in a theater. She wasn't watching a movie. She was in a meeting there. And, and she got up, and she ran around and laid hands on everybody in the theater, and they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. I wasn't there, but she tells me that happened, so I take her word for it. So maybe you'll get a tiny kind of baptism of the Holy Spirit, or, 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 you know, and, 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 or maybe you'll have one like me that was just like, it just softly, I began to worship God, magnify God, and I felt words I didn't understand come out, and and, and, and it's like, wow, it was there the whole time. So, so don't put it in a box, how it's going to happen this way or that way. And then, you know, some people get a little bit wild. Like on the day of Pentecost, they says they were so wild, they were acting like drunks. You know, drunk people can get a little bit, you know, out there. They, they want to buy drinks for everyone. And, and, they, and they laugh and cry. You say, well, what's going on? Why are you laughing and crying at the same time? Uh, but people say, oh, you know, people say, we want to make sure that nothing unruly happens in the church. You know, there's some people that have one scripture verse they can quote about the Holy Spirit, and that is, let everything be done decently and in order. That's the only verse they know. Uh, but most of those people, 
there has never been a risk of anything indecent ever happening because they all sit there and they follow the template and if they lift their hand, they only go this far. So it's all under order. Now, 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 now you know, if, if there was anybody who went a little wild, we can handle it. Pastor Nathan can handle it. I can handle it. We don't get nervous. If you, if you go a little crazy, we'll just put a little wet blanket on you for a while and just let you enjoy some of it. You know, we, 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 we're not afraid. Some people don't know how to express themselves. That's okay. But what we do know is that uh, that's the context in which there was that caution that things be done decently in order because some people, you get so excited. You, you, you just, I don't want to suggest any behavior here. I'm just saying you, you just receive. But just stop thinking about yourself. So whatever way it happens, it happens. If we have to carry out in the car, we can do that for you. We'll do it nicely. We won't even film it. Don't worry. It's not going to go viral. It's you and Jesus. Are you with me? But all of us need to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit. We need to be renewed in the Holy Spirit. And it's wonderful. Okay, I better stop talking. Did you get anything out of that? Amen. Amen.